All right, everyone. I'm here to hopefully talk and not have a bad uh, demonstration. We're trying out new technology here, so uh, please bear with me if there's anything going wrong with this particular video. We're going to be talking about memory again, and we're going to be talking about pointers some more, including some weird ways or weird things you can do with pointers. Uh, so before I get going, let's address some of the up in the room stuff. The homework in the labs are still do. Now, of course, we do not have TAs for the labs, but I'm getting the TAs to make sure that they're covering Piazza and potentially being able to Skype during lab sessions. On top of that, all homework is still due, but I will try and make subsequent homeworks easier or at least hopefully more obvious uh, because I know I won't have face-to-face -face interactions with you guys. So before we get going, one of my most common refrains here when it comes to any kind of online video is to pay attention. Now, I say this purely ironically, or or not purely ironically, but I say it very ironically. First of all, because a um, my videos are not going to be as good as my lectures, hopefully. Uh, I, it's just not quite the same without people I'm trying to do. But uh, more importantly, number two, even myself, when I was trying to prepare for a class, uh, it was a flipped class in, at Northeastern, and it involves um, Excel and Access. So I'm learning what I had to teach in about a month's time. And even then, I kept on checking my emails or doing other things while listening to a video. It's extremely tempting to, to try and multitask. It is the kiss of death when you try and multitask. It's very hard to keep things in, uh, at the same time. And you will keep thinking you can do it, and you will keep on failing and getting into trouble as a result. But just keep in mind, if you try and multitask, things will not go in your head. Even if you think you've heard the video, it will not stick in your head if you're trying to do two things at once. So please try and pay attention. I'll try and make any, any and all of these videos as useful as humanly possible. Uh, I can't guarantee no ums and ahs like I've already been doing, but I will be trying my best. Okay, so here are the, here are the topics for the next little while. First of all, we're going to be talking about pointers a bit more. And then afterwards, I'm going to make another video on bit masks. Uh, this would be things like bit shifting, uh, checking bitwise operators, that sort of thing. That particular topic, topic number two here, it has caused problems in the past with a lot of students. However, I would also like to say, just to make people feel really crappy, my nine-year-old was able to do this. I had I showed him for in about two minutes, and he was able to figure it out. So in case you wanted to feel really crappy, I just wanted to point out a nine-year-old is able to do this. So it's not I, – I found it confusing myself at the same time. He, he's a bit of an, except a weird case. But I want to say it's not an impossible task to learn how bitmasks work or why they are useful. After we finish with that, we'll look at file input and output. Um, that I would have normally have done before we even hit pointers, but I'm trying something a little different. Because in order to read in a file, you still under need to understand how pointers work. And then after all of that, we're going to do some code quality. We'll do a peer review for one of the assignments where we'll actually do code review. It can all be done online. Uh, just for what makes good code, what makes a good comment, may what makes good kinds of tests that you're going to be uh, providing. Number one rule for the rest of this term is going to be that you have to keep on practicing. Reading lecture, just watching the videos will not do it. And that's why we do labs. That's why we do assignments. But since I'm not there sort of guilting you along the way or looking at you while you're checking your phones during lecture. Yes, I do notice some of you checking your phones during lecture. Uh, because I'm not directly seeing you do this, practice is going to be key. You can't just watch these videos and hope to pass the exam easily. A lot of this ends up being you do the actual uh, activities on your own. You can make up your own problems and just code up some uh, code up some solutions. That alone will be take you a long way to making sure you've mastered the material. No matter of watching the videos is a substitute for actually practicing. Much like listening to someone play the piano is not the same as practicing playing the piano. The exam itself has to be an online exam. I'll be making sure that. I follow policies that prevent or at least severely reduce the chance of cheating during that exam, but it would be an online exam. Uh, that's going to be new, and I please bear with me if there's any problems with that particular uh, format. I don't like it any more than you do, but at the same time, it's for safety, and that's a uh, we take that very seriously. All right, so last time around, we looked at pointers. Last time around, we also had a lot of people going, oh my god, please, please be, be gentle, uh, please have mercy. We're doing pointers. Um, pointers themselves are not as crazy as you might think. Essentially, we have the ability to say, 
don't tell me what's in the bucket, tell me where the bucket is located. That is what this thing right here does. Hopefully my pen's gonna work from this video, right? That is, give me the address of the variable val, not what's in it, not what's being stored, but what the address is. And that will be going into a pointer right here. We can also dereference a pointer. So we can actually uh, put a little star in front of it, I find that syntax very confusing, but once you've done a number of these things, it'll start make hopefully start making sense. That says, no, no, that's a pointer. Go to where that pointer is located, uh, where that pointer is pointing, and now look what's inside, or let's look at where, what that pointer is pointing to. That's what that star, uh, that asterisk here is doing. I also pointed out the fact that if I go to a particular position, like position zero, index zero, or index one, it is actually the same as moving the pointer over one position. Now, if it's a pointing to arrays, it moves it four bytes over. If it's pointing to characters, it moves it one byte over. If it's pointing to uh, double, it's moving eight bytes over or 64 bits. It will move however, if it's a pointer to a double, it will move however big a double is, that many uh, bytes over. So effectively, what this, what we were using before with an array index is under the hood, actually adding a number to our pointer because it's just an address. It's like saying, "Who's my neighbor?" Well, I'm at uh, I'm at address um, six. Well, my neighbor next to me is address eight. They're on even number sides of the street. But I could just add one neighbor to me, and I move a certain distance over. That's effectively what we're doing here. We add however many integers, or however many characters, or however many positions I want to move over, and then I dereference. And that is actually what's going on with this right here. So we did this as an exercise last time around. We looked at, let's say, pointer two. Pointer two is just some pointer in space. We have a variable y, which is equal to the value 10. And if I change pointer two to point to wherever y is, the box that has, hopefully, I probably may have another image on here, but I'm going to do it anyways. Here's y. Here's pointer two. It's going to point to the address, but not the value in there. And so if I print out what pointer two is, I will get some weird address in space. It'll be one zero x one two three four five six seven whatever some position in memory. The second line is I'm going to dereference. I'm going to look inside of the bucket. I'm going to look inside where that address is and tell you what it is. So the first line is going to be an address in space, and the second one's going to be the value 10. There's an address in space, random address in space. Here's the value 10. Great. What's really strange about this is I can actually modify what y is without actually directly getting y. I set the pointer to, uh, to you know, aim at y, and then I can just change the value to whatever I want. So here is pointer 2. Pointer 2 is going to be, actually, this is going to give me an error in this case, it, or at least it should. I'm not sure what my solution is going to say, but let's have a look at this. So this is, it's going to point to something. What's it pointing to? I didn't say. Since I didn't say what it's pointing to, I don't know what's going to happen. Y is going to be the value 10, and then I'm going to dereference whatever the heck this is pointing to. It's not pointing to anything yet. I don't know what it's pointing to. The default, or if there is a default, is going to be null, but it, it may not be. It might be some random position in space. And I'm going to set whatever that was pointed to to the value inside the inside that memory to the value 10. Well, that's not going to work too well for me. So what's going to, going to end up happening? That what should happen is that it should blow up in my place, right? Pointer two is not initialized to anything, and so when I set the value to what when I dereference it, it goes. Well, you didn't set it to anything, and it blows up, and essentially I get an error. So you normally need to, when I make a pointer, I want to set it to something. My default is I set it to null, but I could set it to point to some other thing. I want to make sure I set it, though. So here's a floating point, point a floating point, a float pointer, a P, and we have a value X, which is 5.87. Uh, I could set to point to whatever x is, which is 5.87, the box that is st storing the value 5.87. And if I dereference it, I will actually change the value for x. 
this line here is actually going to change the value for x on me. And that's what's really strange about this. It's not x is not going to be 5.87. Because I've shared the address and because I can go into what it was pointing to, I can actually change it on the person. And that's where weird side effects come up. These are some of the weirdest, hardest bugs you're going to find in C. So the value for x is actually 12.62 because I changed it using the pointer. This brings us to another point. We talked about how all functions pass values. That is actually all that C does. You can pass in integers. The value for val1 and val2 right here, these variables are brand new variables, and they get set to a particular value when I start up. Pass my pointer. If I pass in a pointer like a nums, or uh, that would be an example of a pointer, or it could be, um, I could have something like this. Int star, I'm going to use a p. I could pass in a pointer to a particular variable. Both would be fine. Now, if I pass in a pointer to a variable, it, it allows me to change the value versus just making a new variable and duplicating the value. That's actually what we've been doing with scanf. When I wanted to change the variable myNum, I had to pass a pointer to myNum to make it work. That's why it works the way it does. That's why the syntax looks like that. That's why there's this magical and in front. So if I want to read a bunch of student information, I can actually pass in a the pointer to a file i could pass in the size i want to, i want if i want to return multiple things i want to return a student struct and i want to return the number of students or an array of students in this case i want to return an array of students and i want to say how big that array is i need to return two things before i couldn't return two things but now i can because my input parameter is just a pointer and i can actually change the value I can actually say, you know, you're passing me in this integer, a pointer to this integer. I can now change that value for that integer, what it was originally calling me, and allow me to change multiple variables at the same time, not just return one value. Um, so here would be me passing in. Um, so let me do an example of this. So I want to have int. Uh, I'm going to set that equal to zero at the beginning, and then I'm going to call this magical function over here, and it's going to be uh, info. Uh, let's pretend I have something called pfile. It's just a pointer to a file, and I'm actually going to put in num students here. This is a pointer to num students, and when this function is get called. This, I'm going to change I can actually directly change num students here. I can pass in a variable. If it's just the pointer, I have free access to modifying the variable that I, the, the variable that I had around. Before I couldn't do this. Now with a pointer, I can, which leads to some fun in games. In C++, we have we can go one step further. We can actually pass a Pass by reference is, is what it's called. And so instead of using a star for an asterisk, what we do is we just literally, I would call num students like I have right here. Then, uh, But instead of using a pointer, I would just pass it the, val the value. And what it would do is actually I could stomp on the original value. That gets all sorts of crazy. So here is my value, my variable. I then pass it into this particular function like I did right there. And I can actually change what outsize is. Notice what the danger of a pass by reference is. If I don't know read student info is going to change out size, there's nothing in that syntax. If I'm passing in a pointer, I have a sneaky feeling that they might be changing my value. There is nothing in this call to read student info right here. There's nothing that indicates that that is actually going to change that second parameter. It's just I'm, you're asking for a parameter. I didn't say I was going to change it. That's actually one of the dangers of pass by reference. You have to be very, very clear that this function could change the value on, on the person calling it. You may not know that when you're calling that function. So wackiness can ensue. That's only in C++, so we're not really going to do it, but it does pop up from time to time. You might see it in other places.
All right. In case you're wondering about more crazy pointer fun, uh, we can do a pointer arithmetic, like I've already pointed out. We can have pointers to pointers. We can have arrays of pointers. We can have pointer, uh, we and arrays of pointers, pointers of arrays, pointers of pointer arrays. We can do all sorts of weird combinations. So it's easy enough to be able to do pointers of pointers, but if I wanted to make an array of arrays, I actually need pointers of pointers yet again. We'll see that next lesson. So here is me making an array of pointers. So I am making an array of char pointers. Every single one of these things is going to be a char star right here. And this is the number of courses. So let's imagine that each one of these things is going to be a course name, like bit 1400. I could have, this would be an array of pointers, these pointers point to a particular course name. So like bit 1400, bit 2400. And so all, I'm, all I do is keep an array of pointers to all of these strings. So with that, I, uh, what we could do, I would like you guys to try one more time trying the crazy pants way of writing a num test three. Try a couple other ways out. So let me give you a couple examples, a couple more examples, because I actually like this exercise in terms of what Kind of silliness you can do. So let's do. Uh, I'm going to change this value here, and since I I want to do some pointer arithmetic on it, so I'm going to say it's uh, a num test at position one. All right. So first of all, let's actually map out what the heck I'm doing here. Zero. One, two, three. This is the thing I want. So a num test at position one is whatever this thing here is. And so what I need to do is, well, I can't just add two to it. I'm actually pointing, looking inside of the bucket. So what I actually want to do is I will, once I've done that, I could put an and in front of it to make it a pointer to this step out here. And then I could, let's say, add two. That will be pointing at this position here. And all of that. I could dereference afterwards. That would be the same as a num test three. I could also do uh, a num test five minus two. That'll do it. I could do this may not work, but I'll point it out anyways. For uh, position four. And I want to get a pointer to that. And then I want to subtract one. And then I want to dereference. Notice this, that's so A, B, C. Uh, I'm using a laptop screen, so it's not as nice for writing. Notice position, uh, the solution number, uh, solution C may not work because what if the size of my array ends at three? I would be outside of my bounds. I wouldn't have a, it wouldn't be a valid position at position four, even if I got the pointer to it and then subtracted one from it and then got the reference. So technically I could be outside of bounds, but if I knew I had at least four elements, this would be perfectly valid. It would be me pointing, it would be me getting what's in here, then dereferencing it, then moving back one step afterwards. So you can come up with all sorts of crazy ways of doing this. And that's sort of playing around with how pointers are referenced, dereference, and how and how you can combine these three different sets of variables. The square parentheses, which is a, a shift over a certain number of positions and then look inside the bucket. That's why it looks like a box that you look inside of. Uh, get myself a pointer and dereference this, find out what's inside at that pointer. With the combinations of those three symbols, you can try you can try out different combinations of these symbols to see, to make sure you have a good solid feel for how pointers actually work. All right, with that being said, next, uh, next video we'll be looking at 2D arrays and I'll be going over some live code, All right? I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Bye.